The following interview was conducted with Elizabeth J. Hicks for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on February 13, 2008 at the Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years and siblings. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, although I may just put New York City because it's a little more glamorous, but it, of course Brooklyn was it's a, a well -known is suburb. part of New York City and lived there just for six months and then we moved to uh, New Jersey, Westfield, New Jersey and I spent uh, all my school years in Westfield. Um, my father was from Jersey City, New Jersey and my mother was born in Lanali, India of British parents who were there. <clears throat> he, my grandfather, was working for the Great Indian Railway Company. So uh, I, I'm proud, proud of that. And I've always wanted to see the Taj Mahal, but haven't made it yet. <laughs> but, and I do have one older brother now deceased, and uh -huh. that was, uh, what was it the like? Johnston family. Okay. What was uh, school like, and, your, and also high school? Did you go to high school there too? Tell us yes. about that. Yes, uh, elementary school was a walk to school in the morning, a walk home for lunch, a walk to school in the afternoon, and a walk home for, uh, in the afternoon. Um, then we had a three grade junior high, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt Junior High, uh, and uh, Westfield Senior High School. And from there, I went to what was then called Massachusetts State College in Amherst, Massachusetts. I graduated from there, the last class of Massachusetts State College in 1946, and in less than a month afterwards, it was renamed the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. How did you it, happen to select going to college there? From oh, you know? I loved I loved New England. Uh, had you we been had visit? We had vacationed there. Uh, about 20 miles from campus and uh, that was just the most exciting two weeks of every year was vacationing in New England. Oh, now rather than the Jersey Shore, you went to yeah. New England, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I sunburn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what, was the, uh, what was the size of the campus and what were some of the activities that you were involved in there? Uh, well, I was What's a sorority <clears throat> and there were only 1,200 students, so well, male and female? Yes, it was co-ed. And uh, you knew many, you knew your freshman class because the women all had, the women had a freshman dorm. But you got to know the sophomores. It was a small enough school. Sure. And you knew the janitors and the, the mailman. And uh, it was a lovely, charming college now. And of course, now with you know, about 28,000 students, it's... A lot different. It's not quite as nostalgic as it used to be. <laughs> right. um, oh, I guess I spent... Um, my time working different various campus jobs, and people would be appalled at 50 cents an hour, but uh, that what was... What is the perspective that of those the days? Going, the going rate. Right. I worked in a place called the College Store, which had a soda fountain and, and books. And there's where you got to know everyone. Sure, right. Was what, was your, what, what was your major? What? Um, home economics. Okay. And I eventually did practice teaching, but uh, I knew I, it's too bad it comes at the end of your career because uh, I might have changed my major <laughs> because uh, I was not really comfortable in front of the class. But um, after college, I returned to um, New Jersey and worked for about nine months. I was a commuter, which is what my town was uh, in New York City in one of the high-rise insurance companies. And then what uh, occurred? Well, I, I had met John after I had graduated. I didn't return to New Jersey until the fall of 1946, yes. Okay. I spent the summer after I graduated still working full-time in the college store and 
the veterans were returning then, and he had a few credits to pick up for his bachelor's degree, and that's when we met. Okay. And then you got married? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I love New England so much that my mother had to put a wedding on out of town. We were married in Amherst, and uh, that way my friends could be there. Could be. Yeah, could attend. Right. Okay. Where was uh, John born? Where is he from? He he was born in Sydney, Australia, of American parents. His father was a vice president of foreign distributors distribution of Paramount Pictures, and so he traveled a great deal with his parents um, as a youngster. They, and they would sail at least once a year from Sydney back to the States. His dad's business would, he would have to show up on Broadway that often at the home office. So. Uh, but he decided to go to, to uh, school in, Mass in the States. Well, they came back. He, John was born there and then lived there for 10 years. And then they came and his dad bought a home in New Rochelle, at com another commuter town. Mm -hmm. And um, he, was fin he did high, high school in New Rochelle okay. and also was an out-of-state student at Massachusetts State College. Okay. All right. So after you got married, then what was the next next phase of your life? The next step was the honeymoon to Indiana. Um, I had never been further than Pennsylvania. Uh, we were married in Amherst and went around a little little bit, a few other states there, but but <clears throat> we had to stop in Cooperstown, New York, the baseball. Hall of Fame, and uh, we had to see all the New York Giant ex 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 exhibits there. And then the next night we were in Pennsylvania, and then we were in Cleveland, and Cleveland Indians were playing that night. Now that's American League, but uh, Hank Greenberg was pitching, and so we went to, to the, the game. ball game. <laughs> so I, I got used to baseball. <laughs> and then we were here at Purdue. Tell us what, what was bringing, why were you coming to Purdue, what, bringing Indiana? Well, um, the year, the summer, well, it, was, it just passed the summer, and John <clears throat> was taken on as an instructor at the now University of Massachusetts instructor in agricultural economics with only a BS. And uh, during the academic year, uh, someone from Purdue called by, and it was Earl Butts, who was national president then of Alpha Gamma Rho and head of the Department of Agricultural Economics. And he was recruiting graduate students for Purdue in his department. And John interviewed with him and always said afterwards that, well, he made me feel like if I didn't come to Purdue, Purdue would close. So Earl had that special Wait. touch. <laughs> but so John did make the commitment and we were married after his one year there, and we came out here. And but Earl had promised housing for us, and that's where he fell down because you arrived with we we arrived in a Ford with all our possessions and no place to sleep. This so is what 1946? 1947. Oh, okay. July 1, 1947, <laughs> and eventually. We got, got housing in a private home on Meridian Street across from the high school football field. And this couple, the man taught at West Side High, but he sent two of his children to the grandparents so they could rent rooms during the summer to people like us who needed, couples who needed housing. So we were in one room upstairs 
another <clears throat> excuse me, another couple from Maggie Con had another room, and there was a grad student downstairs, and. I said, oh, you always took the scouring powder when you went down. The bathtub was downstairs, and you always went down with your scouring powder. But uh, Welcome to Purdue, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> it, it was interesting. I bet. Uh, was he not there in the house, though? He just rented it out? No, no. The, the parents were there. Oh. They, they had, they had a, a little three-year-old that they kept. Oh. They kept her, but sent the, the, other old, children. the old, older <laughs> children. Away for the summer. <laughs> were sent away so they could make money. Okay. But uh, now you started any uh, ag Aggie con? Did you get then? You must have found a place to live after the summer. Uh, after they finished, um, after the summer, they opened up the barracks. And uh, where were they located? Oh, on a, on airport airport road. The, okay. They don't. Ex they're not a, not married where married student housing is, but maybe across the road. They don't. Well, exist. it's it's where now it's where all the athletic fields are okay. across okay. from what it, they the call Squirrel Park. Okay. And uh, you you had to know which drive to turn down because I I can't imagine how many barracks they had out there, but uh, they were there were a lot of them, and there was one tree. It's just a huge tree. It's it's long gone now, but uh, in the, in that's, the that was our sign turned by the big tree. <laughs> you don't get a lot. <laughs> oh, well, tell us a little about an ag econ being the faculty wife and and some of the activities and interaction with students and well, things. it's it's so diff different now. There there were just we we feel that there is not the camaraderie that the Staff people are hunched over their computers, and the spouses of these people are working. And so the, we had a wonderful women's organization, AggieCon Staff Wives. And um, you did activity. Did you have activities? Oh, and meet, yeah. They were, oh, the men might write a, a play or something, and then it, it would get performed with. Uh, someone playing Earl Butts and someone playing Mary Emma. I mean, that was a silly thing. But uh, we had, oh, not necessarily monthly meetings, but I imagine we were together right. um, six, seven times a year, and then summertime families would gather. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, good. And we, we often, when I'm with friends my age, other staff wives, we, we still lament that it's too bad that we can't have more days like that. Yeah, they were fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, then, of course, your husband became the executive assistant to uh, first Dr. Hovde. Yeah. And what uh, what were some of the any highlights or events and things that you like to share with us? Well, he kind of. He Meanwhile, you had your children too. Yeah. yeah right. That kept. You yeah. Busy. Yeah. Right. Uh, he. Um, it was Doc Young, the dean of the graduate school, who I guess came over. His office at that graduate office was in on the Ag campus at that time, and uh, I guess he he said anyone interested, perhaps in in, in a possible job over in President Hubby's office, and John said, although he'd been teaching and loved to teach, sure. he thought he'd investigate it and. Uh, President Hubdy had an assistant to the president, but that person had left campus, and and um, that began, I think, July 1, 1955. Okay. So he uh, I, he was the liaison also with the with state with general with the general assembly. He right. lobbied for the general assembly for so many 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 years. He could almost drive. 52, it was really before I-65 was sure. done. We'd have to go through um, Lebanon on the way, go th around the square. Uh, but um, he- Were there some uh, events, that were, were more activities that you were involved in there when he was with the- Well, we, we got to go to more, more fun thing, <laughs> fun things maybe. Um, but I, my kids, well, uh, Hubdy Hall, we 
might go down on a Sunday when the building was quiet. And uh, the floor, of course, was linoleum or, you know, uh, that slippery kind, and they'd get in a chair and have a good time. Ha they might have a race or two, <laughs> but uh, they they would decorate down there on, for Christmas. The little kids would make make things for their for a secretary's desk or a paper Santa Claus. I remember we sent for a kit and uh, well, that's kind of nice. They put it up. Yeah, but, get the children involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. And then, of course, he was the interim president, so then you had even more activities, right? That a little different year oh, for you? Oh, yeah. Um, we, we did not move to Westwood, but uh, we had a key, and uh, there were, we did have some activities up there. Sure. But uh, it just, it, we just didn't want to move the whole, the whole brood up there. Yeah. But, uh, and whereabouts were you living in? By that time, you had a house, though. We, we had... Uh, well, our our first home was the 24 by 36, three bedroom, one bathroom. Uh, I mean, that and a pre prefabricated. Um, so it was one of those national. Sounds like one of national. Well, homes. it was it was New Century. It was okay. a competing company, and uh, no garage to, for the first couple of years. But, uh, we we raised seven children there we did put an addition on and then we moved to near Burtsfield school our yards backed up to Burtsfield school and so I always said my kids didn't learn to cross the street till they went to high school <laughs> but it was just wonderful with sure. great location. the kids could just go across the yard and they'd be on school property yeah. Back to the barracks about approximately do you remember when they were they torn down is that what happened to yeah. them? Oh. Yeah. But they must have, well, it sort of take the uh, housing after the war, uh, housing was kind of tight around oh, here. Oh, it was extremely tight. There were, of course, a great many of us in barracks, and then there are others, other couples that were in what they called the black and whites. They were two stories, and they were- they were, along State Street? Or? Yes, okay. yeah. Okay, I've heard that other people have mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And then they put up the uh, hilltop, they put up those bricks and we, those brick houses, apartments, mm -hmm. and we had friends there eventually. Sure. But okay. uh, it, it was a, well, it, it, it was fine. I mean, we were so grateful to get in the barracks, but uh, it, it's, it's not a really great place to raise a baby with a, <laughs> a gas furnace there, because you, you know, you've got to teach them hot. You know, they, they Very should learn on. hot before they learn mommy. Uh, right. but, uh, we managed, though. Yeah, right. yeah. What was the village like when you first came here? Was uh, there much going on there? Oh, the post office was down there, where, almost where Vaughn's is. Okay. And the hardware store, oh, drug nice. store, Southworth. Now. Was there a grocery store there or not? Um, yes, there was, but it was they specialized more in meats. Okay. But you could, I mean, you could park your car but but not it wasn't really convenient sure but as I've thought about it I think I remember three traffic lights when we came to town <laughs> there was one at the bottom of the hill one at the top of the hill and one at Northwestern and uh, Grant? Grant, Grant 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 Street, Street. Right. yeah you got the triple X that was here wasn't oh, it? oh yeah, yeah. yeah. oh right. yes Oh yes, and, and and the triple X when the girls would, when they had outside service, and the girls would be on roller skates, and the, <laughs> oh yeah, we love love the root beer. <laughs> it doesn't go away now that they have the trademark. <laughs> oh, let's talk a little about the Purdue Women's Club. You've been kind of active in that over the years. Yeah. Um, Tell for our researchers what the nature of that uh, membership well, was. It's um, it's. It's changed a bit since I have come. In the beginning, it was uh, just really just for women, for women spouses or women teachers. Um, the graduate students had their own organization, and that was called the Graduate Dames. 
and I got involved in that. They had, I was a sponsor, they, were, they had two sponsors, and we had uh, several, we'd have several programs during the year, and uh, you were a sponsor for two years, and then you've got someone to replace you, but I'm sure it's a, 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 an organization that's no, I mean, it's no, really? I'm no longer here, and I doubt if it's, it yeah, has it any national recognition now, mm -hmm. but uh, that was a, a nice activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know it was, there were still graduate names when Nancy Hansen came, because I saw that I brought her to one of our meetings. Sure. But um, you were were you the president of the Prune Women's Club at any time? Or? Yes, and yeah. uh, I think it was 1975-76. Okay. But it's 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 different now, and I tease that whoever's the president. I said, you know, in the old days, it was like the Rose Parade. You went in, took a low office. And then you kind of moved up through the chairs. You were second vice president, first vice president, newcomer chairman. I, I did newcomers, and now it's four. It takes four women to do newcomers. Not that it's expanded that much, but nobody wants the final responsibility. <laughs> I've noticed that being a member of the club. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it it's um, they expanded. They changed the constitution. Con Institution somewhat and expanded, and there are people that are still they're community people, um, still very may have gone to Purdue, may not have, but are very interested in Purdue and its mission, and uh, they have friends and friends invite bring the guests, and then would you like to join? So some membership is town people, so. It's changed over time. Then. It has. Sure. All right. Okay. How about well, now? We'll talk a little bit about some kids. A king and queen come to Purdue in oh. 1963. The king and queen of Afghanistan. Tell our uh, researchers what went on. Um, well, it was a surprise to Purdue. It came out of the State Department that the king and queen of Afghanistan are coming over, and I think they, they were they were going to another university. Uh, Further, much further west, and would Purdue, I mean, Purdue, you, you get the king and queen on these days, and uh, Fred Hufty said, John, go, you know, be, be on the plane tomorrow to Washington to find out what, what it's What's all about. On? So John went down and came back, and, and plans began to be made. And, uh, was it kind of short notice? So you didn't have it, too it much. It wasn't. It wasn't too long. And then to get the guest list, and then later, you know, you think of oh, there was one couple from the university that didn't make the list that should have, and I'll, I'll still I'll still remember. But uh, that was very exciting for me because it, it really was the position of the governor's wife, Governor Matt Welch's wife, to greet or to escort the queen. And of course, uh, President Hovde was with the king. And they had to hire black limousines and they just weren't available around here at all. And I don't know how many cars they got to come down from Chicago, but the um, plane came in over at Grissom, and uh, John, John wasn't, uh, oh yes, he was, I'm trying to remember now which, which car he was in, but with the king and the president, and John was with um, an ambassador, and I was with the queen and her lady uh, in waiting. And as we came through Delphi, they had excused the school children and given them all an American flag. And as you come, as we came in front of the square there where the courthouse is, all the little school kids had their flags out. I was, That's kind it of was nice. touched since Purdue had nothing to, I mean, they didn't say, you know, let the kids out and sure. wave. But anyway, that was, uh, that was fun. And the queen has set, had 
seven children, and at that time I had seven, and I remember in conversation with her, which I, I thought would be very difficult. She, does, she did know English more than I think she would let, let on, but anyway, I talked through the interpreter, and it wasn't my first experience doing that, but um, I said, I'll raise you to eight, and she said, like, no way. <laughs> but, uh, I, you, I, won, you won. I won the bet, yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, it was... Uh, what what did they have? They had a, a um, as I recall from the newspaper, there was something over in the Home Act building. There was a yes. reception and a dinner. Uh, while, while the king and the, the men went out to the Purdue Farms mm -hmm. and uh, looked at everything but the hogs because they, they weren't interested in the... They don't eat pork, so they kind of, they, they knew how to avoid the hog barn. And Mrs. Hovde, uh, well, she had sent out a letter to say what she was wearing so nobody would, I mean, so she wouldn't have to take phone calls, you know, do you wear gloves, do you wear a hat, and so forth. So she announced her wardrobe. And uh, she came down the steps at uh, Stone, I think it was Stone Hall, and we had the tea there. And uh, they put on a fashion show. The girls who had majored in clothing did a fashion show of their outfits and so forth. Did you like that? The queen seemed to yeah. like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But And then, of course, we had an elegant, elegant buffet dinner that night. That's just, I, I remember. Of course, there was no, they don't drink uh, liquor, but they did buy some wine glasses, and we had sparkling Catawba juice from New York State, so we had bubbly, but it was non-alcoholic. <laughs> it served the purpose. <laughs> the students, uh, student government purchased a little, I don't know whether it's, it wasn't a wagon, it was something that the young, the youngest of their child, the youngest child in that family could pedal, and um, they took it home with them on the plane. But, uh, I thought that I just remember. That's very nice. Yes, remember yeah. that now. Yeah, they were they were only here for what one day or one two day? day. Yeah. Wow. They didn't even they didn't even sleep here. They just they it, came for the, the like in the morning mor and for the morning and then for the dinner and, and then left after. Did you did you go back with them to the air? They no. Left? Did they go back to leave from Grissom? Yes, they did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was quite a big a big affair. And they were leaving from Grissom to to return to their home. Oh, okay. to Afghanistan. Had they you, had they been someplace before they came here? I, I think I think they were at the University of Montana, but okay. I, I, I So there was a stop before had they Oh yeah. Been, right. Yeah. And they had They had been touring a little bit. I never saw their entire sure itinerary. Right. But, well, made front page uh, it, it news. Was, it was exciting. Yeah. You know, me did and you, the, me did and you keep queen. in touch with them afterwards at all? No. Okay. No. We he, did, I did give up a Polaroid picture of my seven children, so I guess that got to Afghanistan. <laughs> Where it is now, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the other key thing is when Ronald Reagan came in 1987. Do you remember, recall that? Uh, yeah. Yes, because John was involved in that somewhat. And... My, I let the kids who wanted to go to it get out of school, and I remember that was the early beginning of security in buildings. Sure. And I had a camera, and um, we, the man took the camera from me, pointed at me, and took my picture, because if, it, if I was going to kill the man, you know, I, I would have killed myself with. I mean, he would have killed me. Sure. So. But uh, we did have good seats. I Where boss did you see him? Were you over? Did you go? Was over in Mackey where he talked, or did you see him or at other spots? No, no, I didn't. He was. He made a visit to Kanoi, as I recall. No, uh, because I, they've got the markers there. But uh, the presentation was at at uh, Mackey Arena where he talked. Yeah. Right. Uh, Which was it? Was it was a big day on campus. But yeah. another another big day on campus at Mackey was when Neil Armstrong came back for um, 
to be honored with not to be honored with an honorary degree. And he came in January. His schedule, of course, was very extensive. But in the winter of 1970, he they arranged a special com convocation for this. And John and I picked him up at the Purdue airport and took him over that evening to President Hovde's home over on South 7th. So, uh, you know, I was just thrilled being in his presence because it was still all, you know, very, very new and exciting. And uh, I had followed him in ticker tape parades and wherever he went, you know, his around the world trip. Right. That, uh, it was I, very nice. Another sad thing that comes to mind is when the uh, Grissom thing, you know, 1967. Oh, oh. That put a pall, I'm sure, oh, over the camp. Very, very sad. Yeah. Uh, Purdue had thought about, after, after Neil's flight, to naming the airport. I mean, the, you know, it's still the Purdue airport, but Neil's hometown of Wapakoneta, Ohio, said renamed their airport for Neil. So Purdue waited a long time, but they have given him a nice honor now yes. with the engineering <laughs> building. Building, that's right. Yes. Uh huh. Now the um, undergrad library was named for your for your husband. Mm -hmm. um, how did you learn about that? It's uh, a nice honor, and it's a nice facility. President Hansen told me um, before John knew. They. See, oh, the reason, I'm, I mean, I think Art tossed out, you know, a building and really kind of asked for suggestions. Do you want, for naming do you, would this be appropriate or would this be appropriate? And I said, oh, definitely the library because John said that it really was student lobbying that made it all possible. They... Um, they had student committee here right, that for over a period of several years that right. uh, had well they got they got it really organized and then these students were to hunt up their legislator on a weekend and then try and go face to face and say how badly this building was needed at the university and John was of course lobbying then and so I thought that's you know it's, it was the student building, but it it was the appropriate one to. I mean, if he was going to get one, it was the appropriate one. For all the work, the timing was right. was nice. Yeah, right. But do, do you know he has a baseball field no, named for him? No, where's that? <laughs> that's up at Purdue campus, North Central. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, again, lobbying. Uh, not, I mean, he didn't lobby for that name, but, but the work he'd done for the, the uh, before the system of the branch campuses came about. You know, they were looking for property and so forth, and uh, of course, different legislators wanted it. You know, geographically at their place, but uh, they picked this place sort of in a triangular area. Uh, part way between Valparaiso and I'm sorry, I can't remember my other cities, yeah, but um, I mean Michigan City or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that would be one. So uh, John was involved in helping choose the property and so forth. For the regional campus? For the regional campus there. And then uh, the regional campus chancellor was always from, or they picked someone from the main campus, and the main campus sent up someone that would, knew John's interest in baseball, and they named it, and we had a, a summer dedication up there of Hicks Field. <laughs> and he's proud of that, too. Oh, I think he should be, that's right. <laughs> oh. And tell your president's council you've been involved in that. You give, you've been giving back. Yeah, actually, 
um, President Council got off the ground about the same time I was involved at the president of Purdue Women's Club. And I got back into staff records because names had been lost through the years of people that I thought aren't getting invited to Purdue Women's Club and um, worked real hard, got my membership up to 975 that year. And someone said they expected me to pay 25 more memberships so I could have a thousand, but of course I never did. But um, in talking over with one person that had been on the staff, former secretary of the Board of Trustees, she felt that Purdue would, had kind of turned a cold shoulder or just ignored the, what her accomplishments here. And I said, well, come, you know, we'll, we'll get you back on the list for Purdue Women's Club. And I guess I was talking this over with Arthur Hansen and Harlan White, if, uh, who was head of ad admissions, admissions. Uh, I guess was putting this buzz in, in um, Dr. Hansen's ear too, that you've got all these retirees that would would like to or be organized in some sort of way and what can we do about it. So my list had, I'd pretty much gone, gone through and recognized some names that other people wouldn't know. Sure. It, of course, they were poorly spelled and the records were really pretty, pretty poor. Well, these have been former staff people or faculty yeah, that have been on? Okay. Yeah. And uh, so that's, um, how President Council started with, oh, just a small group of 20 or so, but uh, enthusiastic retirees like Max Steer and Harlan White, um, especially those, those early presidents of, of the retirees, and that organization is just a wonderful now, the, the, you're talking about the Retirees Association? The Re Retirees oh, okay. Association. Which is, he was started then during Dr. Hansen's? Dr. Okay. Hansen's days. Okay. Yeah. And it's really, uh, oh, it, it, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm mixing up my that's conversation okay. between both, the, I was going to ask you about the Retirees, but yeah, that, which is yeah. one organization and the, that's fine. That was the one I had the, in, well, sure. the influence with and would go to their early committee meetings and so forth. I'm sorry, I didn't. No, the President's did. Council was another one that you've yeah. been involved in too as um, well. And that was started during Hanson's era too. Yes, it was. Right. That uh, It was a good way to find friends who would open their wall, their wallets. For the, and give back. For right? a good cause, right. yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you uh, about your Sagamore of the Wabash. How did that come about? Uh, that was that was from Bob Orr. I, I I don't know. I guess I sat next to him at enough enough dinners or something. Uh, oh, I I don't know. Sometimes I I feel I'm all nerve. And I said, you know these Indiana road maps. She said. I said you you fold them over, you refold them, and by the time you fold them three times, you know they're kind of withered in the middle. I don't know. I just remember sitting Some up one on time it. and telling him that. Yeah. Well, it, it really was a shock. Someone from the university asked if he'd do it, if he'd sign one for me. And so I was just floored. When did they give it? When did you receive um, it? John's retirement banquet. Okay. okay. He, he, he knew, John knew. But of course it, it did, it, one of my friends who was a real good Republican Said I've done more for the Republican Party than you ever have, and you got a Sagamore of the Wabash. I said, Well, you just have to know, have to know the right people <laughs> and the right time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I'm extremely proud of it. It's very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as a friend of mine who also has one said, they have a room at Purdue named after me, the Sagamore Room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them that. See, they think a lot of it. <laughs> Now I'm going to ask you about Casey at the Bat, that favorite poem of your husband. How did that come about? And he is well known for recounting it. 
Well, John remembers the man that did him for theater presentation from Hollywood. I don't remember his name now, uh -huh. but when West Lafayette was looking for a new baseball field, John was not one to pick up a rake and go move dirt around. Some, some men you know, made their contribution with their physical labor, and John said, well, I'll go to any service club or school or you know anywhere uh, if they'll make a, a contribution to the West Side Baseball Field Fund. And so it, it, and he said, I'll, I'll recite Casey at the bat. Well, he's done it, probably did, I'm sure, did, did it more times for free than, than for a fee. But uh, my kids and I have heard it, oh, people say hundreds of times. I don't know, but we... Uh, it was a good presentation when he does it. Well, he, di he did it the year he was acting president in the Hall of Music at the first meeting of all the freshman people. And I was over at the convocation and uh, I was just, he thought it was wonderful. I mean, the, the kids, that isn't, it wasn't very, a very uh, intellectual speech like, you know, you're the, you're the cream of the crop and go forward and uh, the best years of your life were the next four and so forth. But uh, he did Casey the bat and the kids gave him a standing ovation. So he loved that. <laughs> Silly. Where did, what caught his eye on that? Why was that a special poem I, I of interest But just because he was, it was base baseball and... Uh, and it just fit in, it was sort of... Uh, yeah. One of my grandsons is named Casey because of the poem. <laughs> to continue it on. Yeah. Um, when he was the interim president, you, um, he was on the stage. You were not involved in the commencement, but he would be up there. And then there would be some activities afterwards, I imagine, um, for the board or the honorary people or whatever. Yeah, there was always a, a rather semi-formal dinner, and uh, of course we we didn't have as many com we didn't have quite that many commencements, but there'd be a semi formal dinner and then uh, a program usually was either a play shop would do a, a presentation or the glee club but uh, with people coming in their calendars are different and I, it's it's the glee club still has an end of the year concert mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. what yeah. they used to perform here mm -hmm. And for those Talk, talking yes. about things, didn't uh, didn't there used to be a, an annual dinner or something that President Hovde and they, or it have an open house or for the faculty? Oh, for the newcomers. The newcomers. Oh, oh yes. For the new faculty or something, wasn't there an yes, event like it, that? Yes, uh, early early in September, that um, it would be if you were say the department head as their Earl, Earl Butts, he would Earl and. Ms. Mrs. Butts would host the new staff members in the AggieCon department. We would, those people would go to the Hubdi home and there would be a formal receiving line and refreshments. And um, there were, of course, the invitations timing had to be staggered and maybe the Ags would be in the afternoon in pharmacy that night. but. Um, we, and we'd always have supper with the hubbies down down in the basement because you couldn't eat upstairs because that's all where the good food was. But uh, that was that was fun because it was a small fam small. Did he do it for all the schools? I mean, the new faculty in the yeah, various schools. Yeah, I mean, okay. well, it, it, you you weren't there necessarily all ags, but I mean, they whether they did it alphabetically, I don't I don't know, but. Uh, it was, you know, kind of a command performance, sure. and uh, they would always have. Uh, they would invite newcomers, new, second, first year newcomers, no, second year newcomers to pour. So if you had come the year before, you might be asked to. to well, that pour was nice. At, yeah. At the at the right. function, but. Uh, and he gave you a chance to meet, you know, some of the mm -hmm. other new people at that time too. It's very you know, right. 
very nice. <clears throat> How about when your retirement activities? What sort of things did you and John, after he retired, you keep busy in the community, didn't you? Uh, after and retirement, well, he, he, after retirement, he worked a year, or at least a legislative session for Evan Bayh, and then I think he took a first semester, taught first semester sure. for a couple of years. So he really eased out of his out of his job. Yeah, um, he'd always promised me, marry me, and I'll take you to Australia. And uh, I, I did get there after retirement. We hosted a, a Purdue tour to Australia. And uh, then we went again about four years later, uh, just just the two of us. That's nice. And yeah. uh, do your children uh, go to Purdue? Um, my girls, my three girls, went to Purdue, and one has a master's here too. Uh, three boys went to IU, and t two of them. I have to stop and think. This is. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Brian, Brian and Kenny. Yeah. Two of them have masters from Cranert. Okay. And two, one, one went out. Of, well, the other two boys went out of state to school. Okay. Okay. Well, the uh, IU Purdue game should be really good with those oh. your alums. <laughs> oh dear. Well, let's just, uh, what, what a favorite memory of Purdue. You've got one that you'd like to share with us? Or any mm. reminiscences as you look back and look ahead? Well, I had loved my school so much back in New England that I wanted to be a co-ed forever. And the only way you can do that is to marry someone on the staff and I did marry someone who was on the staff at Massachusetts, at the University of Massachusetts, but we came out here immediately. And maybe I thought I was a co-ed for five years after that, why uh, I, I couldn't fake it any longer. I guess I'm no longer a co-ed, but, <laughs> but really for, um, to find happiness, I, I don't, I can't imagine another Occupation. I'd rather have have had a husband be or be in. Right. That uh, nice just, community and everything, both the university yeah. and the local community. And of course, my kids say it's not the real world, Mom, and they're just all scattered in big cities. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. 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 But, Do you have a any uh, closing comments that you'd like to share for the researchers that? Be using this when they're studying the university. Anything special in closing that comes well, to your mind? Good, good, good luck to them. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate the the help I've been given by special collections and archives that um, for accepting what I sent over. Uh, maybe way too much. Some things maybe hit the wastebasket. I don't know. But I, it really. Uh, it's nice to You know. just can't divide his life among the children. Um, his things, I, I have, they have his poems. He, he was quite a poet. And the, the children have those. And pictures I've duplicated for, for them. And, uh, and some of his, maybe an essay or two, but I'm just so pleased they're here. That's very nice, yes. And people can benefit by that. And studying the university. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. You're I appreciate that. This concludes the interview. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat>